this is why you'll find that uh, traditional sculptors, people who sculpt figures in clay, who already have all that knowledge of anatomy, have a really easy time when it comes to picking up the digital medium because all they have to do is just learn, you know, the smooth tool, the pinch tool, the flatten tool. And that's a really easy task. You could learn that in an afternoon, really. The most important features of the neck are the sternomastoid muscles, which attach to the skull just behind the ears, and then narrow as they come down and attach to the top of the sternum, forming a hollow between the two clavicles. The other important feature being the Adam's apple, which is obviously a lot more prominent in men than in women. And now we'll move on to the eyes. I find it most useful to draw in the hollow of the eye socket first, before drawing in any detail of the eye, because the mound of the eye is basically sitting in the hollow formed of the skull socket. And it's this hollow, um, the shape of the eye socket itself, that contributes most to the form in this area. Um, the details of the eyelids, etc., is actually less important. Once you're happy with the placement and shape of the socket itself, you can proceed to draw in the mound of the eyelids and eyeball. As with the mouth, it's important to remember that the, the eyelids from a bottom or top view have a very curved shape. As they are obviously wrapping around the sphere of the eyeball. The upper lid juts out further than the lower lid, which is why if you look down, you can vaguely make out the top of your own cheekbones. One important point to remember about the eyelids is they are actually quite thick. Um, I guarantee they're a lot thicker than you imagine they are. If you just get a mirror and look down into it at the proper angle, you'll see just how thick your eyelids actually are. And I think it's usually okay to exaggerate this a little bit in the sculpts. It certainly looks better if you make them slightly thicker than make them too thin. The ear is basically a shell-shaped structure, um, and when modelling the ear, it's usually best just to hollow out the basic shell shape first, and then add the other smaller features on top. Um, it certainly used to be quite a pain to model in the old days, when we still had to patch polygons together to construct it. It's the sort of shape that requires quite a bit of resolution, because there's a lot of changeable topology in quite a small area. The ear does generally require more resolution than the other features of the face. And once you take a little time to learn and memorize the different parts that make up the outer ear, um, it becomes quite simple. The most important parts of the ear are the helix, the anti-helix, the tragus, the anti-tragus, the lobe, and the fossa triangularis. An interesting point about the ear lobes is that some people have free hanging lobes, um, and some people's lobes are actually just attached straight to the head. Uh, this is a genetic trait, which I think about two-thirds of people have attached lobes and one-third have hanging lobes. Um, you'll note that the anti-helix from the front view often juts out further than the helix behind it, although this isn't always the case. Ears, like the other features of the face, are very, very changeable when you look in the real world at different people's heads. But the basic parts are always the same. <laughs> 